It's Freedom Files with James Burns. Welcome to the Freedom Files podcast for this Thursday, December 8th, 2011. I am James Burns. We are joined now by Bob Chapman, his website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Bob, how are you today? Well, pretty good, as usual. As usual. I'm glad to hear it. And there is definitely a lot of stuff going on around the world, and we're going to hopefully cover all that while we're together today. But the first thing I want to go over is, of course, what's been transpiring in Europe. Break down for us the latest situation going on in the Eurozone. Well, I see lots of marches going on in Germany, and they've got the flag of the European Union, and in the middle of it, they got a Schwarzwicka. <laughs> That's fitting. Now, in German, they call it the Hatzenkreuzer. And um, the, the, obviously, there's a number of people in Germany who realize what's going on. And, uh, you know, if you look back and you put it all together, you'll find that the intention of uh, European amalg- uh, amalgamation uh, is that we see today is nothing but an extension of uh, the dreams of Adolf Hitler. And I think that's why they have uh, the symbol uh, where it is on that European Union flag. Uh, Pennant, actually, it was. And uh, they're still up in the air. They don't know what to do in Europe. Uh, What should they do? Uh, They should cut the six of them loose and uh, they don't have anything and are ready to go bankrupt and try to reconsolidate. Uh, The German banks are coming in with very very poor stress ratings, which means uh, German banks, among others, will be reorganized. What does that mean? That means you get the pay to put them back together again. That's what it means. And uh, the German government uh, will nationalize the banks, and then when they get in better condition, they'll give them back to their owners and probably get the pay for that, too. That's the way that the bankers stay in power, because they pay off and control the politicians throughout the world. And uh, what are they going to do? Hard to say. I think what they'll do is let the U.S. come in, lend the ERC money, and try to change the ERC rules. Don't know whether they're going to be successful with that. Uh, Try to remove the sovereignty from the nations within uh, the Eurozone, there's 17 of them, and that will be handed over to a committee plus 17 finance ministers from those countries, which would receive immunity. And I, I, don't, I can't figure why would they would want immunity. Uh, what do they get planned? <laughs> good, good question, huh? And, uh, of course, the sovereignty would, uh, would be lost by those nations, Germany and all the others. Then they, if they were successful in doing that, they'd suck in the other 10, and they have one amalgamated unit that everybody's supposed to be the same, the same unnatural association of people. And uh, isn't going to work. And it didn't work for Adolf Hitler or Benito Mussolini, and it's not going to work for today's bankers, uh, both in Europe and England and the United States. Uh, they have a sad awakening coming. And um, I don't see any further things going on. The meetings start tomorrow and Saturday. Uh, they're supposed to put this grand design together. Uh, we see the... Uh, i, I got to communicate today uh, out of uh, Berlin. And uh, it pertains to the sale of gold. And uh, it goes on to say, it's one thing for conspiracy websites to indicate that the Fed or the global central bank cartel are doing everything in their power to manipulate the price of gold lower. It is something different when the reputable Deutsche Börse-owned market newsletter just does just does just that. 
And he went on to say, this is the market letter, uh, sources of ours report that the BIS, the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, was selling gold after it popped to a new season high, obviously because they wanted to go down. And so, so much for all of those sworn testimony claims that the central bankers do not manipulate the price of gold. So that's what we're dealing with here. What do we got to do? We got to take that power away from them. And the best way in America is get rid of the Fed. The British can get rid of the Bank of England. And the Europeans can get rid of the European Central Bank. And that would be a great step forward. And then all the banks that are broke, we let them go under. People are going to lose a lot of money. It's okay. They should have paid more attention. And so what will happen next? The bankers will be out of business. They won't have any banks anymore. And it's up to us to stop them from getting new banks. Because they're the ones that started all the problems in the first place. So for the last uh, two weeks, uh, this combined effort of the these three entities have been manipulating the gold prices again. And uh, it's not going to last. It's probably just about over. Um, do they have the gold to sell? No, I don't think so. I think they're using swaps. And we'll find out because if the price turns and runs back up to 1900 to $2,000 an ounce, they're going to have to replace it if they didn't actually have the physical. So we'll wait and see. So that's a development today. And, of course, the reason I've done that is they didn't want gold and silver going up while all these troubles were running around in Europe and elsewhere. And that's the way they manipulate markets. You can see them doing it. They don't care if you know anymore because they are the masters of the universe, so they know everything. I get news from them. We're waiting for them. And when the system goes down, they're going to end up in jail, lose everything they've got. And people who assisted them or were among them who committed treason, I suppose they'll get hung. That's what usually happens to collaborators. Well, Germany has just rejected the simultaneously running of the ESFS, which is wrong, ESSF, and the new ESM. So they want one or the other. Uh, I, you know, I can't figure out here quite what the Germans are up to. Are they doing what the bankers, the Illuminists, are telling them to do? Or are they hijacking this thing because they want to get rid of the euro and they want to get rid of the EU? It could be the latter. He has some pretty, you know, the, the uh, Mrs. Merkel gets up and says this, that, and the other thing, going in the direction that Mr. Sarkozy is and others, and then all of a sudden, they throw cold water in the whole thing. There's a lot going on we don't know about. I promise you that. And it's all not good because what's happening is most of Europe is broke, and most of England is broke, and we know Denmark now is broke, and New York and Washington and America are broke. It doesn't look very good. No, it doesn't, Bob. And this, you know, whole financial mess is, you know, on a global scale. It's happened everywhere. It's happening in Europe. It's happening here in the States. I mean, just today uh, you had a Corzine of uh, MF Global. Uh, he was doing a, you know, subpoena before Congress. And, of course, you know, he pleaded the fifth. And he's, he's like the – you're like a parent, and the, the cookie jar is missing a whole bunch of cookies. And you go to your kid, and he's like – I don't know. <laughs> it's obvious well, that, that he had something to do with it, but he has that guilt-stricken look on his face. Um, he's a very bright man, and uh, I believe the U.S. government was involved in this. And uh, he's testifying in the manner in which he is so that uh, either the SEC or the U.S. Justice Department will be forced to act about, against a number of people. And I don't think it'll be the Justice Department. Uh, I think it'll be the uh, SEC. And everybody will get fined and they'll walk away. Members of the Illuminati don't go to jail. We all know that. 
And so that's the way I think it'll end up. They get fined very, very heavily. But what do they care? They get billions. It's Trump change to them. And, uh, you know, all those buddies of theirs will getting back, get them back in the fold so that they can make those billions back again. All the people that got basically robbed by MF, Bob, do you think that they're going to see any of that money back? That's really hard to tell. Um, I, I really don't know. I I see commentaries here and there that they're not. Um, what I'm told, and I, I don't know this for sure, but this is what I'm told, and, and it seems reasonable, is that what they did was they rehypothecated apothec- hypothecated accounts. And you're probably saying, now, then, what the heck is that? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not a disease, so we can rule that out. When you sign a margin re- uh, agreement with a commodity house, you allow them to go into your account and remove what they want. You're supposed to put it back, but they can remove it. And what they do is they lend it to others. And that's where the re-hypothecation comes in. And that is illegal in the United States, but not in England. So they were going through subsidiaries in England and relending, you know, to raise money to gamble with. And they were only using... 37 times capital, and um, Mr. Corzine was quite proud of the fact that he lowered it to 30 times. Well, that's pretty heavy-duty stuff. But anyway, um, they were using those accounts, personal accounts, to be used as collateral against loans that they got from others offshore, which... In turn, that money was used to gamble with, and they lost. And that's what I think happened. Uh, Corzine is trying to put the blame on someone else he don't know, and uh, of course he knows. I mean, these people are vultures. They're they're animals. And don't tell me I don't know. I worked in Wall Street for 30 years. And um, what's going to happen? Well, there are going to be these investigations, and three or four months from now, they'll come up with all the numbers and say, here's where all the money went. And uh, the SEC will be told, along with the CFTC, uh, you had to claw back all that money that they made, all the money that they have, they being the culprits, and raise $1.2 billion so we can pay these people off. And that's what's going to happen, I think. And uh, none of them will go to jail. They'll all lose their money, which is nothing to them. They can make it all back. Uh, None of the Illuminists go to jail. Remember that. There's two sets of rules, one for the elitists and one for us. Yeah, I was thinking. We, we go out and do what he did. We'd be doing twenty-five to thirty years. Yeah, I was thinking the exact same thing, Bob. I mean, as you said, there's two different roles. If you or I went to a bank with a handgun and tried to rob them for only a couple thousand dollars, they throw us away. But these guys, they're allowed to go in and rob people for millions, if not billions, of dollars. And that's true. And it gets worse and worse every year. That's just ridiculous, and I, I sincerely hope that you're right about that. That the day is going to come when all these people, the elite, the Illuminati, and their cohorts and collaborators, their their lieutenants, their stooges, are held accountable for what they've done. Well, I hope so. That's why I do what I do, and uh, I tell you, I give them a real headache. But I think there's a time coming in the near future. I would guess over the next three years that they're going to come after people like me. And uh, we'll be picked up as terrorists because we tell people the truth. 
Bob, I believe that day is coming, unfortunately, sooner rather than later. And that's something else we're going to talk about as well today is, you know, what happened last week with – I mean, I think we touched on a little bit as well then with these um, <laughs> new amendments to the uh, NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act. And then a couple of days ago it was broken down on uh, Infowars.com and Alex Jones's sites about this – their their plan to officially open and start manning the uh, FEMA camps. And – I think you're absolutely right there, Bob. I think it's only a matter of time before they're gunning for us. Well, what they'll do is tell us to shut up. Mm-hmm. And if you don't get out the airways, you're toast. That's the way it'll be. For me, it's a little different story. They'll have to find me. But then again, if everybody else is out the air, who am I going to go on the air with? <laughs> <laughs> uh I guess you can start your own pirate radio station, Bob. I mean, go and hijack somebody's antenna in shortwave. Well, they they know me quite well, and uh, they know darn right well that uh, they can expect anything from me. Well, I mean, hopefully, I mean, we we can avert that. I'm still trying to be optimistic, as they say. You know, you hope for the best and prepare for the worst. And I really do think that this election cycle does present our chance to turn things around, hopefully. And uh, yesterday, of course, Ron Paul wasn't invited to the uh, Republicans' Jewish Coalition GOP Presidential Debate Forum. And, Bob, my question to you on this one is kind of a two-part. We'll get to the second half of this in a moment. Why are the Zionists so afraid of Ron Paul? Because he tells the truth. Uh, the, the, the state of Israel wants to own the whole Middle East. They act like a bunch of Nazis which fits pretty good with Washington nowadays. And so uh, they don't want the world to know that. They hide behind the cloak of uh, Judaism, and uh, they get away with it. Um, Most Jewish people don't know what they're up to. And uh, I think today a great majority of those people uh, don't agree with uh, what goes on or that Israel is supposed to represent them. And so I I think that there's a time coming when they may lose their source of power. And um, uh, that could be in, when this whole thing blows up. Yeah, and I mean, it's the same thing in Israel as in any other country. I mean, you have the people. Most of them are good people. But unfortunately, we've gotten to the point now where you can just throw a name out there. It doesn't matter which country it is. Uh, they're corrupt. They're out of control. They continue to curtail the people's rights and liberties. And basically, I, I, I can't really think of one single country on this planet that is of the idea and vision of the founding fathers. And I I just think that it's it's funny because Ron Paul has come out time and time again saying, I'm not against Israel. I'm just against foreign aid. I'm, I'm against telling other countries what to do and boss them around. But that, that scares the Zionists, that idea, because we've been so indoctrinated, especially the neocon uh, Bible thumpers, that Israel's the promised land, and we have to protect Israel no matter what they do. And that's true. That's what we are told. And if we express an opinion, we're bad people. Oh, that's not true. I mean, I could disagree with lots of things. They just happen to be included. Yeah. And it's just sad. They, they always use that uh, statement, oh, you're just being anti-Semitic, or you're being racist. Oh, you're full of hate. It's, it's the typical, you know, song and dance they use every time they know they're losing the argument. Who cares what they say? Exactly. I <laughs> mean, talking about... did there ever occur to them that, that we don't care what they say? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, we're talking to Bob Chapman, his website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Speaking of people that we don't really care much about, uh, Trump versus Ron Paul. I mean, there's obviously no love lost between the two, and uh, Ron Paul, Huntsman, and Romney have all declined uh, to attend Newsmax's 27th debate that uh, the Donald is going to be moderating, and only so far uh, Newt Gingrich and Santorum has accepted the invite. Uh, wh- wh- like we were just talking about, why do we – care or even value the opinions of business tycoons and reality stars like Donald Trump? Well, I think as an American citizen, uh, uh, what he has to say might be uh, interesting to some people, and he certainly has a right to say it. Um, Businessmen can make wonderful presidents. 
but we know, yes, he's a businessman. And um, he's had many failures as well. Um, and if he wants to run for president or moderate, that's up to him if somebody will attend. And um, I, I think it's going nowhere. I think the lines have been defined. And we've seen that in the uh, conferences that they've had. And uh, it's just... Uh, a terrible mistake that they made in uh, giving Ron Paul virtually no time at all, and everybody's noticed it. It's like a, a big scar in your face. And uh, so uh, they've lost more than they've gained by keeping him offline, so to speak. And so I think he's going to get more time in the future. And... Uh, uh, this business of Newt Gingrich will fade into the mist after all of the uh, skeletons are brought out. Uh, this guy is an immoral, unprincipled, uh, uh, bad person. And I don't think Americans uh, will want him as president. Herbert Cain went through the same thing uh, because of his uh, secret life. And Perry's got the same problem. So you get Romney and and Ron Paul, and anybody who listens knows that Ron tells the same story over and over again. Doesn't have to deviate. Doesn't have to make up stories so he can cover lies because he doesn't lie. And he's far, far more informed than anybody who's running. I mean, he's an intellect. The other people aren't stupid, but they don't have that kind of background. Now they have, they served in Washington for the many years that he has, although Gingrich did. And, uh, but again, I don't think that he's electable. I, I think we've got a good chance. Um, what's the odds? I can't tell at this point. But um, I, I do think that even if he would lose, he would set the precedent of people knowing what's going on. And that message they don't want the people to get, but they're going to get it anyway. And if he wins, we got a great chance to turn it around. And um, uh, I hope that he wins, and I hope it is turned around, uh, because uh, I certainly don't want to live in a corporatist fascist state, and that's what we got. And uh, uh, I don't think he'd allow that to happen. Many uh, laws would be turned uh, around. Many things would be done away with. And uh, uh, we'd start to balance our budget. Uh, we wouldn't be running around the world killing people all the time. And you people all know the things that have to be changed, and, and he'll change them. Uh, we just got to do the job for him. He can't do it himself. You're absolutely right about that, Bob. And, you know, like yesterday was a prime example because Ron Paul is raising more money for, you know, campaign ads to go after Newt Gingrich. And I think it's a good thing that he's doing this. He's going on the offensive because they need to take out Newt Gingrich now because he's been playing this little game. I mean, I, I saw it coming a mile away, how he was playing, you know, like, oh, you know, we're all, you know, got some good ideas here on the stage and any of us can beat Obama, you know, while everyone else was slashing each other's throats. You know, now it's obvious that, Newt Gingrich seems to be their their prime choice. You know, Ron Paul, you know, isn't, you know, he isn't pulling any punches on him. And they raised over a million dollars yesterday. And th this wasn't one of those planned money bombs. This was something that happened. You know, Ron Paul sent out a mass email and said, you know, we're trying to, you know, generate funds and we need your help in order to get more TV ads in Iowa. And the supporters, they, they rose up to the occasion. They they rose up and they, they contributed. They got over a million dollars. And I think that's going to seriously hurt Newt Gingrich as, you know, he continues to expose, you know, the, the lies and the shenanigans that Newt has been part of over the past several decades. Yeah, I think you're right. I didn't even know that they had had that request, and I'm glad the results were so positive. And all I have to do is tell the people the truth. Uh, you know, 95% of the people in America, no matter how they vote, they're good people. 
they're sick and tired of the immorality and corruption that they see everywhere in the world, including their own country. And uh, they want something done about it. And this guy's the guy to do it. I mean, he's 77 years old, and uh, he could probably complete a solid four years. He's in good health. Uh, he's just a couple of months older than I am, and um, I guess we share the bounty of being healthy. And uh, he might even make it another four years. And uh, as long as you have a strong vice president, uh, then you don't worry about that as long as that vice president isn't from uh, the Illuminati or the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission or something like that. I mean, that's what Ronald Reagan was stuck into. And when he got uh, elected, I talked to him. And I said, you know, all those people you've appointed, they're the bad guys. He said, I know that's a deal I had to make. And I'm glad you brought that up, Bob, because that's something that I've been really worried about. Because I'm, I'm all about hypotheticals, you know, thinking ahead, scenarios and whatnot. And, you know, best case scenario, Ron Paul starts, you know, doing really good in the first primaries. And he starts gaining this huge bandwagon of support because most Republicans right now, they're not picking anybody. They're waiting till the first votes come out, and then they're going to look at who's doing better, you know, the top two or three candidates, and then they're going to pick from them, and hopefully one of those will be Ron Paul. And if he makes it to the convention with enough uh, caucus votes, enough delegates, my fear is that we may see a repeat of what happened with Ronald Reagan taking his rival George H.W. Bush as his VP. Could be, but I don't think so. Ronald Reagan didn't know anything about politics. I mean, in the 30s, he was a left-winger, socialist at best. And George Murphy turned him around in 48 when he got him the job as uh, head of the very liberal uh, Screen Actors Guild. Uh, if it hadn't been uh, for General Electric picking him up, I think it was in 53 or 4 or 5, uh, to do that program, uh, he would have been sunk. He would have been out of the picture. And um, I knew people who were very close to him during those years between 48 and uh, 55 because uh, I lived in Southern California and I knew a lot of people. And uh, some of them were very, very close to him. And it's interesting, I didn't meet him through them, I met him on my own. But um, there, was the, there was always the fact that he wasn't what he seemed to be. He was a nice guy. Uh, but if you knew him well, uh, there were a lot of things that you didn't want to know. Yeah, and that's usually the case for most of these politicians, unfortunately. Well, Hollywood is a very, a very strange place. And I lived in Malibu and in Los Angeles for 36 years. And so I know how it works. And it still works the same way it did before. Yeah, I mean, there, there's just some scary stuff that goes on behind the scenes in Hollywood. I mean, uh, most recently uh, there's been a lot of stories coming out about um, – how there's a huge pedophile ring there. And, you know, a lot of these child actors have been the victims of some of these monsters. And uh, a friend of my uh, sister's went out to Hollywood to try to be an actress. And uh, while she was trying to get, a, you know, uh, her start, I mean, she ended up moving back anyways. But, you know, she got a lot of offers for people to attend some of these celebrity parties, but not to mingle if you uh, catch my drift. Well, you know, it's uh, one orgy after another. And, you know, young people can't believe that. And men are set upon just as much as women are. I mean, this is not where women become victims. Women and men become victims. And, of course, you just talked about the pedophilia. It's rampant, absolutely rampant. And... uh I've seen lots of it, and it's something that just, I used to tell the police in Malibu, the sheriff's department, if I catch anybody with drugs, 
or any pedophiles running around, I'm going to turn them over to you. And they knew me quite well because I coached their kids. And this is a true story. And uh, I'm going to turn them over to you. And you have to arrest them and try to arrange to put them in jail. And if you are unsuccessful in doing that, I will remove them personally from the face of the earth. <laughs> and that's true. I told them that. And so they always felt comfortable when I was coaching and the kids were around. And uh, I was a big favorite of the police and fire department, too. Uh, had a lot of kids and dads worked in the fire department. And, uh, but anyway, uh, you find that in all societies, historically. I mean, go back and read some of the books that uh, describe what went on from, we'll say, uh, 200 years before Christ all the way through. I, I don't think they have much written before that. But uh, there's, it's replete with stories of things like that. So, you know, it's been with civilization for a long time. What's the answer? Uh, uh, I don't know. Well, I, I think that one answer is that we got to start being a lot more harder on these celebrities and these, whether, you know, Hollywood stars or coaches at Penn State, and if they commit a crime, uh, they they should be, you know, have the book thrown at them. I mean, it's ridiculous that you had this coach, Sandusky, who was guilty of this stuff for years. They knew about it for the past, what, decade now, Bob? And only People now observed them. Yeah. And, and only now they decide, oh, we're going to arrest him now. Well, what about all the kids that you could have saved from this monster? Well, money was more important than the university. It's interesting. Uh, the coach uh, that came before, uh, Joe, the coach that's um, just recently been fired, was Rip Engel, and he was a very famous coach as well. And he had a good friend that was a coach at Columbia University. This is during the 30s and 40s, and 50s as well. And during the summer, uh, they would vacation on Cape Cod, and I caddied there. So for two seasons, I caddied for them almost every morning. So I got to know them pretty good. And uh, I was 14, 15 at the time. Uh, but uh, interesting summer, took home a lot of money, was best caddy, and met some very, very important people. You know, it's interesting that the life you've lived, Bob, you know, the things you've experienced, the good and the bad things, I mean, it, it really has, you know, come together to, you know, merge and shape your perspective on the world. And... It is really a, a thrill that actually, you know, today does mark the one year anniversary that you've been on the show with me. So I'm really glad you've decided to stick around <laughs> with me on Freedom Files. Uh, Bob Chapman is our guest. His website, the international forecaster dot com. Uh, moving back into because um, we, we kind of you know, as you usually do, you know, on our discussions, we kind of go off the road a little bit and go wherever it takes us. Uh, going back towards corruption and uh, the elections, I mean, from the U.S., the European Union, we, we move and point our direction towards something we really don't talk as much about, uh, you're Russia. And the elections and the uh, growing anti-Putin protests happening right now in Russia, I mean, with the uh, communists continuing to get closer and closer to taking back control, uh, could this possibly lead to an, a rising tensions between Putin's authoritarian United Russia Party and the uh, Communist Party and perhaps even, like, I, you know me, I like to, you know, don't throw a hypothetical out there, a possible civil war in Russia, similar to what happened between the Reds and the Whites. Um, my feeling is that we don't get enough information from the inside in Russia to really make an intelligent decision. Uh, we just don't really know. Um, is Putin being jettisoned because they want to uh, have somebody else uh, be the leader of their country? Uh, is it a move by the communists and the Politburo to take over again? Um, are they justified in talking about and doing about what they've done? We don't know any of those things. I know they hold against Mr. Putin the fact that... Um, 
that he's been running around like a teenager, you know, beating his chest and look at me, I'm still young, that sort of thing. And, um, uh, you know, maybe he's gotten carried away with his popularity, I don't know. But I, I don't think that's a serious issue. Uh, I think that we just don't know what's going on there. And certainly RT's not going to tell us. It is funded by the Russian government. And so uh, my feeling is that uh, we don't know, and we're going to find out later. Well, I, I agree. I think that eventually the, the truth is going to come out of Russia. And I mean, there's obviously there's some problems there. Of course, there's problems in most of the world right now. I mean, especially in what's happening in the Middle East. I mean, this, this came out, a uh, president of uh, China, uh, Hu Jintao, uh, he was urging his Navy to prepare for combat against the uh, U.S. over uh, both situations regarding Pakistan and Syria. And along with Russia, if, you know, Russia doesn't spew into chaos, anarchy, and a civil war, uh, right now their Russian Navy is involved in a standoff with the U.S. right off of Syria. And, I mean, with these attacks going on in Iran and Iran uh, claiming to have downed a U.S. drone, I mean, they have photos of it, so something happened there. I mean, with all this happening, is this a prelude towards a regional, possibly a third world war, Bob? Uh, it's possible. At the stage of that, it's probable. And... Um, you know, I, you just don't know again. Is Russia going to back off? I don't know. Uh, can they match the U.S.? I think so. Uh, they're not to be underestimated, uh, which is something Americans do all the time, particularly the masters of the universe and the Illuminati. And uh, they may be in for a very big surprise. The equipment and training that Russians have is just as good as anybody else's, in many instances, is better. And um, they've got China to help them. Uh, can the U.S. stand up Russia and China? I don't think so. That's really a handful. And uh, what's Europe going to do? Well, they don't have many troops. I know that. Uh, they got to send them all off to Syria or Russia? I don't know that either. Uh, you, th this reminds me, in a way, of um, the communication between Germany and France uh, during the years leading up to the Second World War. And um, we don't know what happened. But France continued to try to compromise because they really weren't prepared. And, you know, they had the marginal line and they just ran right over it. Around it. And um, so engaging another country like Russia and, uh, and China simultaneously is a real handful. And will it be uh, nuclear weapons used? Of course. I mean, the Israelis won't hesitate one second. And that could bring about the entire destruction of Israel. I mean, Russia and China may lose the war with the United States and Europe. But if Israel starts shooting at Russia, I can assure you, uh, they're going to have some serious problems. People, again, they underestimate the possible enemy or their enemy. And it's dumb. You never do that. You always have to assume that your adversary is as good or not better than you are in order for you to defeat him or her. And uh, Americans and generally Europeans, they think that they can do it and they're not going to have any problems. And they are having problems when they do things like that. That's very true. I mean, 
It's unfortunate. It happens time and time again, Bob, as you well know. People have the capacity to think that their um, fecal matter smells like roses, and they end up underestimating others. I mean, like you were mentioning between uh, France and Germany. I mean, France was capitulating, but at the same time, you know, they built the marginal line, and they thought that, well, here's a country that's threatening us, but at the same time, they can't be that much of a threat because of what we did to them at the end of World War One. And, you know, I think we're prepared to fight. But they were prepared to fight World War One, which was basically the lingering, you know, style of uh, the uh, 18th, 19th century warfare. And when the Germans showed up, when they launched their blitz against uh, Poland and uh, the rest of Europe, I mean, they just caught everybody unprepared. Well, Germany uh, was forbidden to have troops in the Rhineland. It was part of the uh, Treaty of Versailles. They put them there anyway. Uh, they weren't supposed to have an Air Force. They had one starting in 1936. Uh, they weren't supposed to have airplanes. They had them. And we all know about that. But why did that happen? Because the British and the French didn't want to face up to them and tell them, look, you know, by the treaty, you're not supposed to be doing that, so stop doing it early on. And at the same time, behind the scenes, England and the United States are financing Benito, Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler. In fact, uh, I have in this issue coming up on Saturday um, the official proclamation by MI6 that they were, um, I think they were giving Benito 10,000 pounds a month, which would be about in those days, about $50,000 a month, which is a lot of money. I mean, people who had great jobs during those days were making two or 3000 a year. And so Mussolini was spying uh, and being financed. And uh, where was I? I just got to... Right, we were talking about how uh, Mussolini was basically a spy and he was being paid to you know keep an eye on things. Right, right. And, uh, and so... You say to yourself, well, they had this war, but why was the main external secret organization of the United States and British bankers uh, of England and British bankers, and at the same time, the beginning participants in the OSS in American banking and international transnational corporations, why were they financing Hitler? You know, I spent a lot of time at this. I lived in Germany and all over Europe for years. I speak their languages and all that sort of thing. And it took me years and years and years to get the bottom of it. And a lot of very intelligent people were deceived, particularly people on the other side in Germany and Italy, but particularly in Germany. They never knew to the day that they died that Hitler, a good part of Hitler's financing, came from the United States and Great Britain. I mean, if they had known that, well, they would have said to themselves, gee, well, what's going on here? But they didn't know that. They never suspected anything when Schock, who was the Secretary of the Treasury from Hitler, for Hitler, for the Nazi regime, he came from Brooklyn. I mean, it didn't it ever occur to them that maybe, uh, maybe this was uh, a bag job, so to speak, I mean, here you get a German from Brooklyn who's running the the, uh, the German uh, treasury. And there was a lot of things that didn't fit, but I think a lot of people overlooked them. And you have to understand, <clears throat> the tenor of the time, as they say in Spanish, muy importante. And what it means, uh, it's very important. And so what do Americans know about that? Well, nothing. Even the people in the late 80s who fought the war who were still around. Now, it was important because the situation in Europe after the Treaty of Versailles, which Germany surrendered and agreed to reparations, etc., there were two groups of people. Well, there was a small third group who wouldn't get involved in anything. Said, we don't agree with either of you guys. So we're not going to play. But you were either... And this was throughout Europe. 
you were either a national socialist or you were a communist. And there wasn't any in between. So Americans and historians and others should lean very, very heavily on that climate. Because a lot of good people who would have never got involved did. Because, you know, you had the communists running around doing this, that, and the other thing. And then you had um, uh, the National Socialists doing the same thing. But the communists didn't have the kind of financing that Adolf and the fascists in Italy had. And so they lost out. They didn't have the leadership either. They were far outnumbered. And, um, and keep in mind, as we have found out through history of the last century, that the Soviet Union was financed from Paris, New York, and London. So this is a game that the bankers play. And the people who are the bankers and control the bankers, the people of the Illuminati, this is a game they play over and over and over again. Two reasons. Control, wealth, and getting rid of population. And that's what it's all about. But most people don't know that. They didn't know conditions, what they were like uh, in the 1930s. Well, they don't even know what conditions are like right now. I mean, they think that the, everything's okay. It'll be, get better. We're going to have a recovery. They've got, they got to take care of things. Well, I get news for you. They're not. No, they're not. And, you know, as a wise man once said, Bob, all you got to really do is follow the money. And what we were talking about with uh, World War II actually does tie into an email question we got from uh, Timmy. Yesterday marked the 70th anniversary of the Pearl Harbor attack. Do you believe that in the official story, and I don't think you do, I don't believe in it either, or uh, did the FDR administration know that Japan was going to attack? And I'd like to add something to that question. Was Japan also financed by the banks? I can't answer the second part because I do not know. Uh, but I do know one thing. Uh, when I went into counterintelligence, the first thing that I learned the book was The War in Ether. First printed in German in the early 1950s. And I got a, co a copy of it. It was a re what they call restricted in those days. Only certain people could read the book. And it described how the <clears throat> Japanese diplomatic code had been broken. And that was in 1937. And they knew everything that was going on, what was coming. Uh, they lined up the ships in Pearl Harbor to accommodate the Japanese to get in the war. And there was plenty of evidence for FDR to take action. He didn't do it. They wanted a war. And they got it. 3,000 people paid for it. And uh, that is when, and this was early on, in 1954, when I was first uh, in counterintelligence, I said to myself, I don't want to work for these people. These are not good people. Uh, these people are worse than the mafia. And so <clears throat> I've been talking about this since 1954. And in September of 67, uh, the U.S. government admitted that the codes had been broken and they knew the Japanese were in the way. And then three weeks ago, I think it was U.S. News and World Report said the same thing in another report. So I figure everybody's dead, so nobody's getting injured. Unfortunately, we lost Bob Chapman in the final moments of the interview. Uh, the phone call dropped, and we were never able to get him back online. And it was a very interesting discussion we were having about what happened uh, regarding the uh, Pearl Harbor attack. And over the past couple of decades, more evidence has come out to basically prove that the official story that we had no idea that the Japanese were going to attack 
is not very believable to say the least. The International Forecaster is about business, finance, economic, social, and political issues all over the world. Published on Wednesday and Saturdays by email, it contains between 35 and 40 pages each time. There's also a hard copy that goes out twice a month for those who are not on the internet. You can get a free introductory copy by going to theinternationalforecaster.com. That's theinternationalforecaster.com. You can also log on to www.intforecaster.com. That's I-N-T forecaster.com. And if you got a question, you can email Bob anytime. Bob at intforecaster.com. That's B-O-B at I-N-T forecaster.com. And you can also call toll-free 877-479-8178. That number again is 877-479-8178. And if you want to subscribe to the International Forecaster, they have a special offer right now, a free one-year subscription. It is fantastic and a great gift for the holidays. And we'll talk to Bob Chapman next week right here on the Freedom Files podcast.